All right, let's keep the baseball talk rolling with the wonder boy of baseball Twitter that has turned into the wonder man of baseball Twitter. If you aren't following him at, at Jeff Passan, you're doing baseball wrong. From ESPN in our past, it is Jeff Passan. Welcome home. How are things, Mr. Passan? Not as good as your hairline these days, Tim. <laughs> you like it? You think it's uh, fancy? Did you see uh, James Click, by the way? Oh, I saw that. Uh, your Fine brother, looking gentleman. I like, like, like. <laughs> he he is Canadian McCallum. It's fantastic. Or American McCallum. Oh, wow, I butchered yeah. that so bad. I got to take the glasses off too. Hey, I, a lot of Jays fans don't understand uh, kind of like who this is, what this is, and why it's significant news. What can you tell us about James Click and what the Jays just added here? Uh, they added the most recent World Series winning general manager, <laughs> a guy who really made his career down with the Tampa Bay Rays, was hired by Andrew Friedman and worked with Eric Neander and Haim Bloom. And you can go on and on about the, the talent that was in that Tampa Bay front office and ends up getting hired by the Houston Astros after Jeff Luna was fired in the wake of the cheating scandal. And all he did was put together a World Series winning club. And I understand Luno gets deservedly a lot of the credit for bringing in, uh, you know, a number of players who contributed to that championship last season. But the reality is James Click filled out that team. Uh, unfortunately, his vision for the team going forward was not the same as Jim Crane, the owner. And so he was offered a, a piddling one year deal coming off of a World Series, which is unlike anything we've ever seen happen to a lame duck GM in baseball history. And uh, rather than take this one year deal, uh, he decided to become a free agent. And he is essentially doing the same type of gap year, one would believe, that Alex Anthopoulos did when he went to Los Angeles after right. he left the Blue Jays. And, and it could turn into a similar role of Ben Sherrington, who spent a few years in Toronto before he took the Pittsburgh job. So anytime you can add brain power to your front office, it's a good thing. And the Jays hired a really, really smart guy who has a lot of good experience for this role. And even though it's it's not defined like clearly what he's going to be doing, I think that's a good thing. It leaves the role open for him to explore projects or uh, involve himself in different areas where a, a more defined role might not allow him to. So, I mean, we, we break it down here, and the Jays have now added, as you, as you mentioned, adding brains to the front office. Uh, Don Mattingly on the bench, Victor Martinez, Paul Quantrill. I mean, this fan base is somewhat divided on Shapiro and Atkins and the regime here. Jeffrey, more than a few of them have used the term Shatkins to describe them. Uh, I don't agree with it, but that's what they've been saying. I think they've built a pretty good program here in Toronto. Like, what's your take from the outside looking in on what they're building here? I mean, let's look at the guy who was on screen there. They signed Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Uh, well, I guess Alex Antopoulos yeah, did sign yeah. Vladimir Guerrero Jr., didn't he? Okay, yeah, well, no point being, Vladimir <laughs> Guerrero Jr. is still around, and Bo Bichette is still around, and it's not like they're lacking development. I mean, going out and getting Dalton Varsho for a, a guy like Gabby Moreno, that's a trade that takes some cojones to pull off because mm -hmm. Gabby Moreno could be one of the best catchers in the big leagues. And yet you've got Varsho, who's uh, somebody earlier this week said to me, Dalton Varsho with the fences where they are now is going to hit 40 home runs this year in that ballpark. They convinced George Springer when mm -hmm. people said the Blue Jays can't sign any big free agents because they're in Toronto and because of the, no, they convinced him to go to Toronto and join this team that up and down the lineup has really, really good players and adding Chris Bassett to the rotation, bringing in Brandon belt on a cheap deal. Uh, and, and beyond that, drafting and developing well the fact that ricky tiedemann has gone from where he was drafted to where he is now seen by the industry in a shorter period of time that's the sort of steal in the draft that makes the difference between a championship caliber ball club and an also ran and right there it's all you need to know the philadelphia phillies then last year reached the world series and odds makers have the Blue Jays ahead of them this year. I think the American League East is certainly within their grasp, but things have to go right. More than anything, they got to stay healthy. Right. If they can have George Springer out there for 140 plus games, if Boba can be an Iron Man, if Vladdy can turn back into the 2021 version of himself, 
uh, then I think that the Jays may not just be favorites in the American League East. I think there's a really good argument to be made that uh, they could be favorites in the entire American League. We'll see how all this plays out, of course, and that's part of the fun here. All right, Jeff, it seemed like the weekend of the pitch clock. Um, have you formed an opinion on this bad boy based on what we saw this weekend? Yeah, I adore the pitch clock. I think <laughs> no, it's going to – I gonna, <laughs> I, I, I mean – Okay, I, I, I'm going to make a comparison now that people are going to suggest, okay, these are apples and oranges, and they are. Uh, what I'm about to say, I'm not comparing the two except in terms of their on-field impact. Okay. I think the pitch clock has a chance to impact the on-field product more than anything since integration. And I say that because, well, look – like, look at what the games look like now. Yeah. They are not anything like we've seen in baseball since the 1980s. The average game time coming into today, and I know it's just two days worth of games, so small sample size uh, alert here, but the average game time has been two hours and 38 minutes. The average game time in spring training last year was three hours, one minute. This is right in line with uh, what we saw in the minor leagues last year, where 25 minutes a game were chopped off, but it goes beyond the time itself. Right. It's just the game is so much crisper and quicker and cleaner and more action filled. And that to me is the biggest selling point here. Like I understand the three hour barrier. It's a real thing for people psychologically. Like who wants to go see three hour movies? Like, there's a reason that movies, generally speaking, unless you get a director who's got final say on everything, don't go three hours. It's because the audience doesn't have the the discipline to just sit there and watch it and to wait it out. At the NFL, we get one day a week, and that's why we can tolerate three, three and a half hour games there. But with baseball, it's every single night. And you've got a pregame show, and you've got a postgame show, and you've got media saturation everywhere. If you can end a baseball game in two and a half hours, Tim, if that's your goal and you can get close to that, I think it opens up a wide, expansive audience that you might not have had access to otherwise. And that's what Major League Baseball is going for here. They're not doing this because the the diehard fan has been complaining because he and she, generally speaking, is not. Yeah. I love baseball even at three plus hours. I just like it more at two and a half the way it's being played. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be really interesting because two and a half, too, is with the scoring up. So while it's a small sample yeah. size, we might even get shorter than two hours and 38 minutes because the scoring has been up in that small oh, sample size. Tim, 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 there is going to be a sub two hour Major League Baseball game this season. Yeah. There are going to be multiple sub two hour major league baseball games a season which is a like it's a wild thing to conceive of but <laughs> yeah. if, if you go and look at the first 35 games six of them were longer than three hours the fewest runs scored in one of those games was 14 so it's clear yeah. like run scoring high scoring games tend to correlate relatively strongly as one would assume with longer games 12 of the 35 games were shorter than two and a half hours. That's a full third of games yeah. at less than two and a half hours. That's a good sign for Major League Baseball. And I think uh, I really do believe a lot of people who have been turned off by what baseball has turned into are going to tune back in or maybe start their fandom. I know guys that would go down and watch Burley and Holiday pitch because oh, they knew it was going to be dream. quick. And Burley versus Holiday was – the dream matchup. Yeah, you know, you know a really interesting element to this, and you could see it if you have a subscription to MLB.tv. You can go back and look at minor league games from last season, I believe. Yeah. One phenomenon that happened that I don't think anybody at Major League Baseball considered, people are going to stick around to the end of the game. You go and look at the end of minor league games prior to the clock, and, you know, the front five rows, if not empty, they're certainly not full. Uh, with the pitch clock, you stick around to the end of the game because the commitment just isn't the same. Right. And and we've been talking for years about how baseball has to bring kids back into being fans. Well, what easier way than not having games that go past 10 o'clock on a school night? 
Yeah, especially when you get into the postseason, we're starting them later for TV. Anyways, I'm not going to yep. get into all that, but I agree wholeheartedly. We got about a buck and a half left here, but which of the other new rules isn't getting enough scrutiny because we're all focused on the clock because it's so interesting? I think the lack of defensive shifts is going to be great for left-handed hitters and is going to be great for singles, but the one that interests me more is base running. And that has two elements. Number one, you have larger bases gone from 15 to 18 inches. And that change has shrunk the distance between the bases by four and a half inches. Doesn't sound like a lot, but just look at how bang, bang uh, stolen base attempts are. And you know those four and a half inches can make the difference between safe and out. And beyond that, the number of disengagements or the time you can step yeah. off the rubber if you're a pitcher. You get two disengagements uh, essentially before a, a, a batter or a runner rather can advance. And so if you try and pick a guy off twice, uh, you can throw over a third time, but if you don't get him, it's a balk. So you better be damn sure you're going to be able to pick him off. And, and the consequence of that is very simple runners are going to get bigger leads Huge and they're going to be more emboldened <laughs> to steal bases. Yeah. And look, I, I, I don't know if I speak for everyone. I feel like I do hear stolen bases are awesome. Yeah. And the, the lack of them in the modern game has uh, been a negative. And I think coming back now to an era where you could see a guy not just stealing five, uh, 50 bases in a season, which hasn't happened in five years, but 75 bases, which hasn't happened in 15 years, is a great thing for the sport. I'm with you. Uh, before I let you go, Jesse Rubinoff has a few tweets uh, from the friends of the show. What's going on over there, Jesse? Well, people love uh, Jeff's answers, but they also enjoy what's going on in the background. A shout out to Jeff Passon, says Roy, for the Enter the Wu Tang album yeah. behind him. I told you that friends. he bombed this atom atomically. Yeah. Like, what are we uh, talking about here? Josh <laughs> says, cool to see Jeff Passon has an NES on the shelf behind him during his Tim and Friends <laughs> hit today. Yeah. And Don says, love yeah. Je Jeff Passan's choice of album in the background, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. For those who purchased in 73 that album, it was with posters and stickers. What a classic 50-year album. Passan wasn't alive in 73. <laughs> still like the music. Were you, Passan? No. no, I was not. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Yeah, I thought maybe I, you were. I thought, I, I, I I thought you were maybe a young looking. I actually am, but uh, not, not the big 5 -oh quite yet. Are you 40 yet? Yeah, I'm 42. Yeah, see, he's not that young. There guys in my ear were saying like it was grossly unjust. Like I'm, I'm 47. I was born in 75. You're a man. Come after me. I'm yeah, a yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm 47. <laughs> Pass it. Always love having you on the show and uh, love the background. Love the bomb atomically. Socrates philosophies and least hypotheses on the pitch clock. Thank you, buddy. Which thanks for the children. <laughs> There's Jeff Passon.